welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're visiting a very important topic, the importance of mental health, mental health support and resources for the LGBTQ plus community with special guests, Dr. Ann Robinson, Executive Director of the Montrose Center in Houston, Texas, Stacey Walt Walls, CEO of the LGBT Life Center in Virginia, in Norfolk, Virginia, Rob Wheeler, Executive Director and CEO of the LGBTQ Community Center of the Desert in Palm Springs, California, and Robert Boo, CEO of the Pride Center at Equality Park at Wilton Manors, Florida, returning guests. So thanks so much for, for coming in to discuss this really critical topic. And mm -hmm. it, it, it is critical both because we need to celebrate, celebrate, uh, particularly this month, um, a, a lot of progress and a lot of change, but also grapple with the fact that there are that there are real attacks on the change that has occurred, and it has to be defended. We have to be talking also to people who are of different uh, views and, and trying to encourage, con convince, cajole people to uh, please accept and also demand acceptance of our fellows just all around us and and uh, and be able to create the respectful and joyous America that that we should have. So let's let's just go around the room and and please help me as a as a straight white guy to understand uh, what I need to to know about uh, doing my part to create the world that that we need to be in. And and Stacy, why don't we start with you over at the uh, LGBT Life Center? So welcome, and I'm Stacy Walls, and I'm um, we serve all of Virginia Beach, Norfolk area, uh, coastal Virginia, and um, our organization has been around for 34 years, serving first people with living with HIV, and now the entire LGBT community and people with HIV. And so for us, we provide uh, a variety of mental health services, social support groups, therapeutic support groups, individual counseling, individual therapy family therapy. And I think the most important thing for us is ensuring that we have low barriers to care, that we're accessible to anybody. Um, and I think what COVID taught us was we can do it even better with telehealth options. And, and so ensuring that people from the LGBTQ community and people living with HIV can access care with a culturally affirming and competent therapist. It's the most important thing. Sometimes um, if people aren't accessing culturally competent care, it can actually do more harm than um, was originally starting with. So um, it's our mission to do it. And we've come up with different strategies in order to make sure that we have a wide array of therapists available to help anybody in this lovely, diverse community that we have. And, um, and that means a variety of therapists too. And so, and recognizing when somebody needs services and how to offer that to them in a very safe space is incredibly important. And so, so you're leading people where they, where they live, right? Yes. Yeah. And I think all of our staff have to understand what mental health needs look like. That's an important training component. And Anne, how do you, how do you, what's your cut on meeting people where they live or, or providing the, the appropriate uh, range of different services to address community need? So we have been around for 44 years in greater Houston area. And um, we started out as a behavioral health clinic and have always been that that's our core services and, and have always had the same philosophy that that Stacy uh, talks about. How, I'll tell you though, right now, our most pressing problem is dealing with youth because in Texas, they're being attacked and we, we have a wait list for our mental health services, but we fast track anybody who is under 18 uh, and anybody who's in crisis. But we have had a, a huge uptick in youth who are coming out as non-binary, coming out as trans, and are not finding the support that they need at home or in their school or in their community or in the media even. Um, and that's that's been our newest um, priority. Now, the thing that, that 
I think is so interesting here is that if you look at this as as a divided uh, sensibility, the attacks are so often perpetrated by people like me, who, you know, is 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 a hetero, um, hetero white guy, right, against other people who identify differently. What would you say to to me to stop that? I mean, I, you know, it's, it's the law is one thing. How do you stop the thinking that leads to the problem that is creating the need for traumatic care because tax have increased? How do you do that? I think the number one thing that changes people's minds, or at least makes them think about it, is to meet people who are different from them and who are of the group that they don't understand. And, and uh, that doesn't always solve it, but it does help them to start think about thinking about what somebody else's needs are and how what they say and what they do can be hurtful. You take away the fear, you, you create the connection, right, Rob? I mean, isn't that part of it is you, you create the connection because we're all, we, we're not born wanting to hurt somebody else. Right. right. I mean, I think one of the pieces that is really important is that humanizing of individuals, right? Because what happens in these uh, these sort of political divisions, uh, LGBTQ people are 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 they we lose our humanity and we become we become othered and we're a group that is sort of unseen uh, other than for uh, leveraging us um, to to win a political argument, a battle, a, um, uh, to to uh, create spaces where we feel unsafe and unaffirmed. And, and so as Anne said, I think that the idea of sort of bringing a humanity to people's attention and the impact that their behavior, their words, um, their calls to action are having on individual people, in particular young people who are um, incredibly vulnerable. And um, as they're figuring out who they are and what they believe um, to be you know, subjected to this kind of rhetoric and attack um, is, is, is deeply hurtful and, and interferes with their own you know, personal uh, development. Now, when you also have intersecting uh, issues, for example, you know, my, my wife is Filipino, we have a biracial family, a blah, 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 right, multi everything. And then you have these intersections. Uh, and I'm very cognizant of the fact that we have, you know, four white uh, people on, on this, uh, on this discussion. Um, how do we deal, how do you deal with uh, ensuring the culturally appropriate aspect of this? Uh, male, female, different ages, different ethnicities, and so on. Uh, Robert, uh, you want to take a cut at that? Because part of this is that we, we've got to start modeling sort of a different way of being. But if, you, if we invite sort of at random four leaders from across the country, and they're all white, right? I mean, we've got, we've, we've got another problem, don't we? Absolutely. And, and that has been um, uh, an opportunity for every organization across the, the country within the LGBT um, uh, work of ensuring that we have representation at the table to ensure that we are reflecting um, and looking like our, our communities. And sometimes we do it better than others. Right now, you would probably think, oh my gosh, well, all four of us are are, are white and uh, would not be able to uh, necessarily um, um, have an affinity with the marginalized communities. But we do have, um, we surround ourselves with appropriate board members, team members, community members to ensure that we uh, do keep in touch with what are the needs of each of our specific communities. You know, Stacy's in Virginia and Rob's in California and Anne's in Texas and <clears throat> and Indian in Florida. Anne and I could probably pretty much relate since we have a lot of the same issues and attacks going on um, uh, within our states. Uh -huh. I would add also that I think in our community we we have a leadership pipeline challenge. 
right? Folks just don't become a CEO. And so a part of our focus in, at the Center in the Desert is uh, really building and mentoring, uh, building up and mentoring our teams and identifying those folks where there's leadership potential and opportunity and a desire, you know, to grow. Um, I was at the New York Center for 22 years and that was a, a big, racial equity was a big part of our work. Um, and some of that was really focused on um, who are our next generation of leaders and how do we ensure that they don't look like this panel entirely, right? And that's work that takes time. And so I think having some grace and patience for ourselves in that, but also a, a, a real commitment to that work and and to modeling that for our peer organizations. Well, I think that it's true, Rob, but um, allow me um, a, a amendment to that because I think it can also be true and false. I, I think that it's also uh, the case that there's a huge amount of talent that is not necessarily articulated in traditional uh, ways that, that fill the preconceptions of boards but are perfectly capable of running these organizations. The problem is, is in many cases, that we don't reach across different aisles, and so um, uh, vehicles that have been um, that have paths that have not been open then become the fact that those paths have been open become the justification for not opening the paths in the future. I think we just sort of have to get over ourselves, and that's and that's the challenge that we all have, right? Get over our preconceptions. Let's get. Let's get to this issue of how do we shift the trajectory of the country in a way that engages more people in a willing uh, collaboration that promotes justice and understanding and across different political parties. It is not healthy to have a, a Republican Party. It is not healthy to have certain religious groups. It has... It's not healthy to have certain uh, racial groups or profiles who are systemically um, against full equality and full understanding. So that's not that doesn't work for us as a society. How do we how do we create this? Um, we were talking before the show a little bit about partnerships that that can be forged. Uh, can we just sort of go around the room, Rob? Let's start with you since since um, since you just made the last comment. What kind of of uh, activities do you, that you have that are that are really about s trying to create systemic change, not just dealing with the with the issue that an individual has at the moment. And we're gonna we're gonna get back to that, but the systemic change that we need so that we don't have so much of a problem. I think you said it well, partnerships, right? We, uh, in the Coachella Valley, we have a very diverse region uh, that spans from the Inland Empire to the to the border with Mexico and Imperial County. And, um, and, it, and it's a very rich um, region of, of different cultures and, and perspectives. And so part of our work is reaching out across our communities and connecting with others and, and um, telling folks our story, but also most importantly, listening and listening to where we um, can both be a partner and a support, um, but also to learn and grow in our own work from, from the work of others. Uh, Robert, um, what, and, and I know that you're going to have, there are certain elements that are going to be similar, but could you could delve into a few of the details uh, of what you're doing at the Pride Center to Quality Park? Sure, so um, not, people do not always come to us. Um, so we need to go out into the community to the marginalized communities and embed ourselves in there and build the trust. Um, and that takes time um, and it takes effort and it also takes dollars to be able to do that. So um, for any organization to just sit back and go, okay, everyone's gonna come to us, that's, that's not gonna work. So we do have to be out in the community, be visible. And to piggyback off of what something Anne said, is we need to make sure that we make the topics kitchen table topics to remove that stigma, to remove um, any of that negativity and make it commonplace to be talking and having conversations and, and talking it again over the, the kitchen table. And that removes that fear, that unknown. And um, you can just talk about it, right? That mm -hmm. you're giving people permission to ask. Look, I ask ignorant questions all the time because I'm always talking with people who are smarter than me, right? So I, I've i given myself permission, but also more importantly, others have given me permission to, to ask questions that they might consider stupid and, and, and get those answered. We just finished a poll and we talked about the importance of understanding 
And it looks like people think that that one of the biggest issues is just importance of, of understanding, right? From family, from 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 uh, others in the community, and so on. And this sort of rejection, this this lack of acceptance, is 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 a real is a real problem. And we're we're also in the middle of another poll. And I'd, I'd be very interested in hearing your view about this. We we are asking: Are the struggles of LGBTQ plus youth different from those of LGBTQ plus more senior people? And the overwhelming answer, eighty percent, is that it's really different. <clears throat> is it really different in your in your view, or or do we have uh, much more in common across the generations? Who is that for? Is that for me? Yeah, sure. Um, yes. Yeah, so we have a youth program. We have a senior program. In fact, we have a new senior housing program, and it's very different because the seniors grew up in a time when they just weren't out, and they may have been married to someone of the opposite sex. Uh, to to hide, they may have children who they had to come out to later in life, and um, they were really the trailblazers that allow the youth now. I mean, people that came after me, but also the youth now to be as out and have much more options. Um, but it doesn't mean that the youth aren't having a hard time. It's just different. Um, and and we do we do a lot of training in the community. That's that's and I'm sure everybody else does too. That's one of the things we do to try to get even just basic terminology out there so that people understand when their youth come home and say I'm non-binary that they understand what that means because that's that's something that's even newer to 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 people outside of our community and uh and we even train the police that's very controversial um in the community a lot of people don't want us doing that but if we don't train them if we don't talk to them they are not going to have any sensitivity to, to that's the, interesting you know, it's it's controversial oh yeah why why is it controversial to train somebody who wants to understand but does but doesn't i mean it wouldn't be controversial to do any other kind of training right well, i mean yeah they don't all want to understand first of okay. all and and uh, i mean because there's been so much um violence from the police and uh historically i mean you talk about the seniors they were arrested for wearing clothing that that didn't conform to their gender identity and uh and then their name was put in the paper and they lost their job the next day uh so and that was something the police did and the the um you go back to the stonewall oh and, black, and, and, and blackmail and and all sure. these different things you know sure. uh, be quiet and resign because i want you out of here right so that there, kind there, of thing yeah there's a there's a mistrust and and a mistrust of motives and uh a lot of people think that well they just want to check a box that they had the training but i mean and it depends on who the police chief is we've had some some people who've been very supportive of us we now have a resource officer on our property five days a week uh from eight to five to take um uh victim statements for people who are afraid to go down to the police department and there's controversial about that people don't want her I mean, she's part of the community, but they don't want her on the property, even though she's in plain clothes. But we have found she's been very helpful uh, a number of times in in helping us with issues and helping our clients with issues. Could you could you all talk a little bit about that that whole idea of of creating uh, threads of communication and collaboration? Um, because in a sense, your intermediaries. Right. And in a sense, it's really needs to be everyone to everyone else. Right. It's 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 everyone who who serves in these different roles in societies and everyone who is served, which you're helping to to create that dialogue. How do we get a situation where people are actually talking to each other on a routine basis in a way that allows these kinds of communications uh, to take place? Are you are you, Stacy, doing uh, any type of convenings, that kind of thing, where everybody just talks about what they need to talk about with each other. Yeah, I think that what Anne talked about earlier, and and that our responsibility to educate and and 
and have the dialogue. We created these programs and I know all the other centers have similar ones, what we call community conversations where you bring people in, it's a safe space for people to talk about the things that are impacting our community. And I think it's also important to recognize not everybody in the community is the same. It's just like outside of the LGBT community. And so, you know, creating a safe space in the centers and supporting that effort um, is important so that if it is a conversation about gender identity and not everybody understands gender identity or gender expression, that that, if you're going to have that conversation, you make it safe for everybody. And until you have those open conversations, then nothing really changes. And I think to further expand on what Anne said, like the police is a great place to start, but we also, we train EMTs when you're responding to a crisis. We serve a, a community that has like eight cities together. We have a police liaison in every city. So our intimate partner violence crisis counselors know who to go to. And that takes a lot of work to develop that infrastructure with the police, with the EMTs, with um, the mental health hospitals, all of those different things. And, and that is work that um, I'm not sure that every single mainstream provider has to do. Um, but for us, it's the most important thing that we do so that when our, our people show up anywhere, in an ER, in, um, you know, at the social services office to apply for benefits, all of those things when they show up there, that they are treated with respect. And those partnerships and that interesting dialogue for education is the primary piece that we do. And it, it makes an impact on the community. You're, you're making such an important point. Uh, my uncle has, has Parkinson's disease, right? So the interactions of, of different elements, or, or you have, um, for example, there was this whole study about oximeters um, inaccurately measuring the oxygen level of African-American um, uh, individuals and therefore placing them at greater risk from COVID treatment. So there you have the interaction of race and, and a certain treatment, right? We, it's, it's, it's everybody. It's not just the, 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 the uh, it's just not, not just law enforcement. It's, it's doctors. It's, it's uh, uh, people in school districts, right? Who are educating uh, young people who might have to look for the signs of, of bullying. Um, let's go around the room and let's talk about uh, two different things if we, if we could. One is a particular program that you're proud with. We'll start with Rob. And then, and then let's also talk about that whole idea of both serving the community that requires service, but also creating the understanding so that the the problem is not is not accentuated. So, as you're talking about programs that you really are proud of and that should become a model for others, uh, let's let's deal with both of those aspects: direct service and also just systematic eradication of this of this issue. Rob, you want to you want to kick us off? Yeah, I think I'll talk about two two things that um, are I think will be really interesting for folks. One is uh, this, our center operates a community food bank, and uh, that we serve not only LGBTQ plus people but the entire community. Right? There's no there's no no barrier to access, and it's part of our programming in which we want to really support the whole person. And um, one of the things that is just really crazy is um, how the stigma that comes with food insecurity and how, and what a hidden um, challenge this is. And, and we are now um, in our region, you know, in scale size, serving 275 um, unique households each week. Um, and our numbers are far exceeding um, our highest threshold during the, in the midst of COVID. Um, and so our, our community in many ways is in, in uh, and, and many, many folks are in an economic crisis. Um, inflation, cost of living, food, gas, people are choosing between pet food and feeding themselves. And so um, I'm really proud that we, we um, have like leaned into this space. Uh, and then the other piece is our work in the school districts. Um, the Coachella Valley, Palm Springs, you know, I think people think about this area as, um, you know, very LGBTQ friendly. Um, it's a resort town, but the, the fact is that there um, is a tremendous diversity of people here, including folks who, who grew up locally. Um, and there's a great opportunity for change within the school districts. And so our outreach, our engagement, 
enrollment, um, our, our trainings, uh, I think are really having an impact, in particular Down Valley, which is a primarily Latinx um, uh, immigrant uh, and uh, socioeconomically uh, disadvantaged. So it feels really perfect good. examples, right? I mean, you've got food, which everyone needs, and it becomes a way to just make, make community. Right. And and just be together. And just to, when you're together, you're you're confronted with people who are different than you are, different ages, different sizes, different whatever difference. And and um, you're working together, Robert. Um, uh, what kind of um, can, can you top Rob in terms of in terms of your program? We're going to we're going to play uh, play a little bit of a game, you know, to, try and change society faster. Uh, Robert, you, uh, what are you doing at the Pride Center? Well, I don't know if I can talk, Rob, but <laughs> we're doing our part here in South Florida. So um, we have the uh, largest weekly gathering of LGBT active agers, seniors, that uh, pre-pandemic, it would be around 200 people every Tuesday that would come to our program. And now, um, at nowadays, we're building it back up to 130, 150 people per week. But um, uh, and then we also built the state of Florida's first senior affordable and supportive housing um, uh, community with targeting the LGBT community with our programs and services. And so that has been um, very important work of, of bringing that to the community. And um, South Florida is a retirement haven for many uh, people who did advocacy work up in larger cities in New York or in New Jersey or you know people are now even moving really from California here and so being able to provide those services that support for the community as well as tapping into those uh, skills and talent that they brought with them and trying to ignite it because sometimes they're going well I fought back in New York City I want to retire and we're like nope we still need you Come, come help us. So um, that has been uh, uh, one of our big accomplishments. And then to be, piggyback off of Rob, um, Broward County is the sixth largest school district in the country. And they are a model of programs and services that they've put in place over the years for the LGBTQ plus youth. And uh, they really have put in all of that support and structure, which is now at risk because of the um, politics that's going on in the uh, trans sports bands for right. uh, young women um, in grade school, middle, high school, college, uh, et cetera. And then just lately, um, just recently announcing the uh, wanting to restrict and ban any of the um, uh, medicine, medical, um, that is offered for transgender youth for hormone, hormone blockers. And so we are under attack, um, even in the one of the locations that has built the best support structure for, for youth. So you start by attacking the, 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 the smallest group that you can, the weakest group that you can, the most marginalized group that you can, and then you broaden that attack as it as it gains purchase, right? So you 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 start, you know, it's sort of it's 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 the bully's tactic, right? You smart, start with the smallest kid in the schoolyard, beat them up, and then you gather support, and you start systematically moving moving through that schoolyard until you dominate it. And um, what are you doing in terms of of, of both supporting? Uh, the people who are victims in that in that way, but also um, changing the changing the calculus from um, uh, uh, being the person attacked to being the uh, the person who is in power to create a change. So uh, I just want to say one of our biggest accomplishments, I think, sometimes is just surviving and still being here forty four years later, but. Um, we're stepping up our advocacy efforts and working more with our state organization that that does that. Um, our legislature only meets every other year and and to try to limit the damage that they can do. Uh, but uh, so we're preparing for that and and also working with people on the national level and uh, and hosting forums to make sure that 
that people know what's going on. But I need to step away. Um, I had a, a hard stop at 1030. So I'm going to thank everybody and uh, I'm going to need to step out. So thank you all for including us. Okay, and thank you. And Stacy, let's give you the last word. Um, what is what is the the thing that we should take away in terms of what we ought to all be doing as as uh, as we look at this uh, this situation? I think that one of the things Rob said earlier that sticks with me, and I think we have really intentionally tried to do, is just decreasing the stigma associated with everything that we do, right? Because it's the biggest barrier for people asking for help, particularly those of us who are in Southern states or states under attack. And so for us, systemic change, which is what you mentioned, and the direct service change. So for us, like we have this trans teaching trans program. And so as a systemic change, as an employer, we hire people who are from the community to teach the community as well. And so our, our policies and our personnel policies, um, accepting and, um, and equitable for all of our employees, including and specifically our trans or trans identified employees, and then so they can then turn around and teach and bring along the trans community to be our next generation of leaders right and so um, that's one of the programs for us that is a mixture of systemic change but also direct service change in the community that we're serving and you know teaching other people and having community conversations about how can everybody be an, a better provider for everybody until that person gets to to us and so how do they hand them off to us if they end up showing up at a different organization and and i think none of this makes any difference until there is listening and discussion and and that all has to happen under a safe environment it doesn't happen when you're being attacked by your state government it doesn't happen when you're being attacked by the federal government it happens when you create a safe space and so everybody should support their lgbtq community centers in their local communities because that is our mission is to create that space for all people to to access care in a safe environment well america's mythology includes space for difference and it's ironic that we are giving up on part of, of that myth that makes us great that aspiration to not have a party line to have all these different voices that come together to form a country where we have a tendency to give up on that to look for a unitary truth and there is no unitary truth Dr. Ann Robinson, Executive Director of the Montrose Center in Houston, Texas, Stacey Wells, CEO of the LGBT Life Center in Virginia, in Norfolk, um, and Rob Wheeler, Executive Director and CEO of the LGBTQ Community Center of the Desert in Palm Springs, and Robert Boo, returning guest, CEO of the Pride Center at Equality Park at Milton Man uh, Manors, Florida. Thank you so much for helping me to understand more about how I can also uh, make a contribution to to uh, uh, the changes that are required. Thank you so much for sharing your programs with us. Stay safe, and and really, it's it's just been a a, a terrific honor. We're going to talk about an associated issue on um, Thursday, and we're going to be talking about again mass shootings and attacks on others, and we've all experienced it in in one way or another in schools in nightclubs, um, uh, tragically throughout America, this seems to be on the uptick. So we're going to talk about it and we're going to we're going to keep talking about it. And we're going to keep talking about it until some change occurs. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Have a great day. Thank you. Thursday.